Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Kevin Costner is no stranger to tales of the American West. He's directed and starred in the 1990s epic Dances with Wolves, and he played patriarch John Dutton on Yellowstone. And now he's bringing audiences another story about settling the West in Horizon, an American saga told in four parts. It's his most ambitious project ever, financed with some $38 million of Costner's own money. Tracy Smith caught up with him on the set of his passion project. You can practically see where all the money goes, especially if you happen by one of Costner's shooting locations, like the one he showed us outside of Moab, Utah. Around here, it's not so much a movie set as a time capsule. Every detail is accurate, down to the doorknobs. Do you feel like the setting is a character too? The town is a character? Yeah, no, it, you, you want to create an, uh, an environment that's authentic, so it's an important piece. Later in the show, Kevin Costner on the casting of his bodyguard co-star, Whitney Houston. This is a little different, but it's another, I guess you could say, risk that you took. Back when you made The Bodyguard, the studio didn't want to cast well, Whitney Houston at I first. I think they thought that, that maybe there was a better choice, you know. Um, that it, you know that some of our more established actresses might have you know been a you know the act have the acting chops or whatever word you want to say, uh, I, I I'm you know I, I like to think that that's what it was, and I think for the large part it was you know you, you don't cast like an unknown a lot of times in a really important part although the part was going to be manageable it didn't have to carry the movie it just had to carry those scenes that they were in at that point, and I. I didn't see it as a risk at all. Just like Horizon, I didn't. Just like I didn't see it. I I saw what I saw was Whitney was the one. Then from high stakes cowboy dramas to one man's quest to uncover just where he came from, Matt Katz wondered about his father's identity for most of his life, always noticing that he had a little lighter hair and skin than his family or his classmates at Hebrew school. A simple DNA test set him on a course to find his father and a family. He didn't even know existed. I took a DNA test, as did my wife, just to see if we could, you know, figure out a little bit more about our people. What were you expecting? I was expecting to find out oh, I was 100% Jewish. And instead? Instead, I found out I was just half Ashkenazi Eastern European Jewish, and I was half Irish. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Kevin Costner says he's had the idea for his four-part Western drama, Horizon, an American Saga, for some 30 years. So why make it now? Well, in part, because he wanted to include his teenage son in the process. Here's Tracy Smith. Action Abbey. Action Abbey. When Frank Action. Sinatra sang My Way, he could have been singing about Kevin Costner. The Oscar-winning actor-director is at work on his most ambitious project to date, a four-part saga of the American West, and just like old Blue Eyes, he's doing it his way. By the way, Sinatra liked to have a little fun with reporters, too. Looks like you did your homework. I did. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, I wonder what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's nothing you can't answer. Right. Um, Show the people just for a second. <laughs> now I have to deal with this. Um, it's so you finish shooting parts one and two, you're in the middle of three and four, your baby part one is about to be born. How are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. Uh, I'm like a wagon headed west too. It's I've just run into everything that you can imagine. I have to hold onto the rope because I got this pact with the audience that I'm gonna give them something. I'm gonna let them, I want them to go west. Go West, indeed. Costner's Horizon, an American saga, is spectacular in every sense. Why don't you help her? There are four parts, each one feature length. And Costner says he put his own money, $38 million, into the project so far. I just hear, I don't know if you've seen the producers, but I hear Nathan Lane's voice saying, never put, put your own money money no, in the show. No, it's true, but it's not true for me. 
You know, conventional wisdom, right? What if everybody's wrong? And you can practically see where all the money goes, especially if you happen by one of Costner's shooting locations, like the one he showed us outside of Moab, Utah. Around here, it's not so much a movie set as a time capsule. Every detail is accurate, down to the doorknobs. Do you feel like the setting is a character too? The town is a character? Yeah, no, I, you, you want to create an, uh, an environment that's authentic, so it's an important piece. You and I are standing guard in one of the last great open spaces. That looks like a promising place. The place I might be able to see myself. The story is authentic, too, about the lure of the Old West and the tragedy of the people who lived here first. That these towns, they weren't like mushrooms. They didn't just pop up. They were fought for. This land was contested. And it was always an ugly finish for the Native Americans, always. And so um, those are themes that, um, while I'm embarrassed by that, kind of ashamed of how it went down, I'm also not afraid to talk about it. I like it. Yeah, and there's a story there. There's a hell of there a story be. there. There can be. Let's roll, camera. Costner's own story is pretty epic as well. His directorial debut was 1990's Dances with Wolves, and he had to put his own money into that one, too. When it premiered, the New Yorker film critic Pauline Kael called it childishly naive, but Costner had the last laugh. Dances with Wolves, Jim Wilson and Kevin Costner. The film won Best Picture, and Costner took home Best Director as well. Costner's made other big movies, of course. You might know him from a few baseball films in the 80s, but it seems he's always felt comfortable in a cowboy hat. Nothing happens in this valley I don't know about. He helped make Taylor Sheridan's Yellowstone a monster hit for our parent company, Paramount. But that's over now, maybe. So tell me, did you have to leave Yellowstone in order to complete Horizon? No, I, I, I did everything that I was contracted to do with, with, with Yellowstone. Would you like to go back? I, if, if the, uh, yeah, if, if I liked the story, where it was going, I would go back. And you get up there and get him. That's, but that's right nice. now, he has his sights set on something else. How did it grow from one to four? Parts? I wasn't done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, listen, how one t became four, even I kind of like, kind of go, really, Kevin? Uh, but it's so good right now. I, I really love it. Tomorrow, you be aware of the time. I want you to draw your water and get your team hitched ahead of all these others and don't stop anyone asking for help. Now, Costner says he's had this story in his back pocket early. for three decades. So why did he make these films now? He says the young man in this scene, his real son, Hayes, is a big reason. Okay, now, come, now, now, it's all right. I'm gonna be with Dad. I saw Hayes at 13 and I said, I got to do this movie. It was your son? Yeah. I said, I want him in that movie. I'm going to make it. And that was it? That was it. The film's debut in Cannes earned him a standing ovation and also drew some less than glowing reviews. But to 69-year-old Kevin Costner, making the movie is worth anything and everything. Will you ever put your money in a project again? I probably will. I, I, in the world of business, I, of movies, I don't think I should have to. But the reality is, if nobody wants to go fishing with me, I'm going to go anyway. If you have any money. No, you will. You will. No, that was mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. Sorry. It's okay. You just said it right if up there. If I have any I money. Can... I know, one more good deal, I'm out of business. Now he's hoping crowds will line up, like fans who got a sneak peek at Joint Reserve Base, Fort Worth, Texas. Mr. Kevin Costner. He's still raising money for parts three and four, but like a famous cowboy once said, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. This is the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? It has been, and it continues to be. You know, if I hear the word billionaire, one more time, I think I'm just gonna roll over because I don't have that kind of money. And I believe in this enough to just go, Shh. So, you know, all these guys, all these scaredy cats, 
It's probably why they have so much, because they're smart and they hold on to it. I'm not that. I just really believe in the idea of what this can be, and so I just keep pushing it. After the break, an exclusive excerpt from Tracy Smith's chat with Kevin Gosner. Something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. I want to live this moment right now. As promised, here's more from Tracy Smith's interview with Kevin Costner. You talked about your love of movies, and I get the sense that you love movies, not so much the movie star thing. Is that fair to say? I like the mechanics of movies. I'm not immune to get, you know, seeing the premiere with my family and, and the people around me and, and having that moment. But I have not lived outside the lines of the, of the work. I, 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 it doesn't define me. The, the, I, I, I love the writing and the editing and, and uh, the dreaming and the scouting locations. And then I have a whole other life that, you know, where I you know, just want to look for treasure, you know what I mean? I, you know. Look for treasure? Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, really go look for treasure. I like to dive on historical ships. You know, I like, I like to do those kind of things in my spare time, watch my kids succeed in sports or succeed in their level of friendships, their circle of friends, and, and, and that feels good. This is a little different, but it's another, I guess you could say, risk that you took. Back when you made The Bodyguard, the studio didn't want to cast well, Whitney Houston at I first. think they thought that, that maybe there was a better choice, you know, um, that, that, you know, that some of our more established actresses might have, you know, been, a, you know, the act, to have the acting chops or whatever word you want to say. Uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I like to think that that's what it was. And I think for the large part it was, you know, you, you don't cast like an unknown a lot of times in a really important part. Although the part was gonna be manageable. It didn't have to carry the movie, it just had to carry those scenes that they were in at that point. And I, I didn't see it as a risk at all, just like Horizon, I didn't, just like, I didn't see it. I, I saw, what I saw was Whitney was the one. And that it, and I, and, it was hard to talk me out of it because I didn't see what the risk was. I realized that she was black. Don't you see that she's got the stateliness, the kind of the ability to sing? It didn't seem risky at all, and I'm kind of glad things are that way for me, that I actually see them clear, and I can take out the noise of fear. I'm like, fear is like, wow, everybody's so afraid that this is the right girl. It doesn't it feel like she's the best girl, you guys? Can you think past that to what comes after Horizon? I, oh, I can, yeah. But, I, but what happens is I want to kind of live in this moment. I, I, I'm, I told you I have a pile over here of things that feel really good to me. But what happens is, is I need to stay right here in this and, and, and everything that's happening in my life, whether it's with my children, whether it's with the movie, whether it's just dealing. I want to live this moment right now. You know, I need to figure it out. Up next. Finding a Father. Welcome back. Journalist Matt Katz grew up not knowing his biological father. That missing piece to the puzzle of his identity led him on a journey documented in his podcast, Inconceivable Truth. I spoke with him about his quest and just what he found. This tale, like so many good yarns, begins with baseball. I love that inside pitch. Matt Katz is a lifelong Mets fan. Playing ball with his son Ruben is what memories are made of. Did my birth father like baseball? Does he like baseball? And because I had for many years no contact with my birth father, I would wonder about like little things like that. Matt was raised by his Jewish mother, Roberta, and Richard, his Jewish stepfather. As far as I'm concerned, he is my son. His father was out of the picture, and he felt rejected. And he tried to mend that? He did. He tried to see him, but it didn't work out. No matter how much of a dad I am, he still needed to know where he came from. But as a boy, Matt rarely got any answers to that question. Why isn't he interested in hanging out with me? Why isn't he interested in knowing me? Where is he? When he was about the age his daughter Sadie is now, Matt noticed something. I look different from other people in my family and also a little bit different from other people at Hebrew school. I had lighter features, redder hair. 
My elderly grandmother was like, no, he's not Jewish. And Deborah, Matt's wife, is of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So is Matt's mom, and so is his presumed biological father. So where in the world did the fair features come from? I took a DNA test, as did my wife, just to see if we could, you know, figure out a little bit more about our people. What were you expecting? I was expecting to find out oh, I was 100% Jewish. And instead? Instead, I found out I was just half Ashkenazi Eastern European Jewish, and I was half Irish. I did not say that. It seemed inconceivable, and yet it sort of made sense, too. I would look at myself in the mirror and be like, wow, you know, holy crap. You do look like a half Jewish, half Irish guy. <laughs> Just like a four leaf clover, his family tree started to blossom. He found out that he had three half siblings as well. It's like wild to be like middle aged and like all of a sudden have sister in laws and cousins and I mean, that never existed before. But here's the thing none of them knew their dad either. But one of them knew something the others didn't. She tells me that she was conceived via sperm donor. Which likely meant Matt was too. So you get this information, and then you got to have a pretty awkward conversation with your mom. Yes. Right? How did that go? I was very nervous about it. Now we should preface what follows by saying Matt is a Peabody Award-winning journalist at WNYC Public Radio in New York. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office announced that... Peter he's used to tracking down answers. He's used to asking tough questions, but not of his own mother. Yeah, I remember sitting on the couch, and he prefaced the conversation with how much he loves me and how much he loves Richard, and then he threw the bombshell. <laughs> I said, did you ever get a fertility assistance when you were trying to have me? She says, yes, they tried to get pregnant for many years, and it was hard. She said they had indeed gone to a doctor who discovered the problem wasn't her, but him. I wasn't hiding anything from anyone. The only thing I was hiding was the fact that I had artificial insemination, but I thought it was with my former husband. So, And then I told her, well, that's not what happened. It was donor sperm that you were inseminated <laughs> with. And she, she put her hand over her mouth, and I think she... Might have used the S word. <laughs> Once all of us were conceived in the same manner, then came new reproductive methods. What Roberta didn't know is that back then doctors treating male infertility would sometimes mix a husband's genetic material with an anonymous donor's, ostensibly to help improve the couple's chances. Now, Matt was born happy and healthy, but the secrecy of it all left him in the dark about his true dad and his mom wondering with whom she had had a child. Do you wonder about him? Like this, yeah. Is there this... Yeah, I do. I could have walked down the street and he could have been there and, you know, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> he was a shadow from 1970s Manhattan. A ghost who, it seemed, didn't really want to be found. Some of Matt's friends even questioned if Matt should keep trying. The devil you know might be better than the devil you don't, right? You had no idea where this was going. No, there's a risk there, right? You don't know what you're going to find. You don't know if there's more hurt. These look like mathematical calculations on how to get to the moon. <laughs> right. But Matt and his half-siblings doubled down. A professional DNA sleuth was brought in. And eventually, a picture turned up of a man with the same long face, same eyes, same hairline as all of them. His name was Vincent McNally. But Matt needed more proof. He had to have been in New York City on the day I was conceived. Sure enough, in an old 1976 New York City phone book, a Vincent McNally was listed with an address in Greenwich Village. It was just brick and mortar, but to Matt, it was gold. I mean, I, I feel it in my, my, my body. I, do. Yeah. I feel like a, a, a sensation. He was here and he was in, in my presence in some way. That's Vincent McNally in costume. Turns out he was a professional stage actor. He donated sperm as a way to earn extra money. Matt found pictures of him, theater reviews, and playbills, including an eerie description of one of his final performances. And one of those plays, his estranged children, adult children, come back and find him. It's a lollipop. 
But the ghost Matt had been chasing all his life eluded him one final time. Just before Matt was going to call him to tell him the news, he found a death notice. Vincent McNally had passed away just four years prior. Maybe we were never supposed to meet in person. Matt celebrated his daughter's bat mitzvah. Two of his three half-siblings were there too. A blending of a now extended family long overdue. His smile makes it clear that Matt has finally made peace with his past. In part, he believes, because talking about it has been healthy. He turned his journey into a podcast, Inconceivable Truth. I don't think, I don't think it's my father. Holy oh. That's found an audience of other people whose ancestry search is still ongoing. For Matt, he's just thankful for the stepdad, the only man it turns out in Matt's life truly worthy of the title dad. You don't need to keep searching anymore. I don't, but I can keep telling the story because it's a cool story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.